Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Briex mining scandal. So Briex was a group of companies in Canada called Briex Minerals LTD which was a major part of Briex based in Calgary, who was involved in a major gold mining scandal when it reported it was sitting on an enormous gold deposit at Busang, East Kalimantan, Indonesia. Briex bought the Busang site in March of 1993 and in October of 1995 announced significant amounts of gold had been discovered, sending its stock price soaring. Originally a penny stock, its stock price reached a peak at Canadian $286.50, split adjusted, in May of 1996 on the Toronto Stock Exchange, with a total capitalization of over 6 billion Canadian dollars. Briex Minerals collapsed in 1997 after the gold samples were found to be a fraud. Busang's gold resource was estimated by Briex's independent consulting company Kilbourne Engineering, a division of SNC Lavalin of Montreal, to be approximately 71 million troy ounces, or 2,400 short tons, or 2,200 tons, Reports of resource estimates of up to 200 million troy ounces, 6,900 short tons or 6,200 tons, were never made by Briex, though the property was described as having this potential by John Felderhoff, Briex's Vice President for Exploration, in an interview with Richard Bihar of Fortune magazine. Briex's gold resource at Busang was a massive fraud, encouraging gold values were intersected in many drill holes and the project received a positive technical assessment by Kilbourne. Crushed core samples had been falsified by salting, which in mineral exploration terms, salting is the process of adding a valuable metal, especially gold or silver, to a sample to change the value of the sample with intent to deceive potential buyers of the mine. A well-known example of this is the diamond hoax of 1872. So, in 1871, veteran prospectors and cousins Philip Arnold and John Slack travelled to San Francisco. They reported a diamond mine and produced a bag full of diamonds. They stored the diamonds in the vault of the Bank of California, founded by William Chapman Ralston. Prominent finances convinced the reluctant Arnold and Slack to speak out on their find. The cousins offered to lead investigators to their field, and investors hired a mining engineer to examine the field. They planted their diamonds on a remote location in northwest Colorado Territory. They then led the investors west from St. Louis, Missouri in June of 1872, arriving by train in the town of Rawlins in the Wyoming Territory. They continued on horseback, but Arnold and Slack wanted to keep the exact location a secret, so they led the group on a confusing four-day journey through the countryside. The group finally reached a huge field with various gems on the ground, and Tiffany's evaluated the stones at being worth of upwards of $150,000. When the engineer made this report, more businessmen expressed interest. They included banker Rolston, General George S. Dodge, Horace Greenlee, Asbury Harpending, George McKellen, Baron von Rothschild, and Charles Tiffany of Tiffany & Co. The investors convinced the cousins to sell their interest for $660,000, which in today's money equates to $14.9 million and formed the San Francisco and New York Mining and Commercial Company. They selected New York attorney Samuel Latham Mitchell Barlow as legal representative. Barlow convinced him to add U.S. Congressman Benjamin F. Butler to the legal staff. Barlow set up a New York corporation known as the Joe Conda Mi- Joel Conda Mining Company with a capital stock of $10 million, while Butler was given 1,000 shares for amending the General Mining Act of 1872 to include the terms valuable mineral deposits in order to allow legal mining claims in the diamond fields. The U.S. Attorney General George H. Williams issued an opinion on the August 31st of 1872 specifically stating that the terms valuable mineral deposits included diamonds. Finances sent mining engineer Henry Jannon, who bought stock in the company, to evaluate the find. Arnold and Slack led him and a group of investors to just north of what is now called Diamond Peak in the remote northwest corner of the Colorado Territory, where Jannon and the investors found enough diamonds in the soil to satisfy themselves. Jannon submitted a highly optimistic report, which found its way into the press. 
geologist Clarence King, who had led a survey team that recently completed a geological exploration of the 14th parallel, had a chance meeting with Janin on a train. King and his team were alarmed at the reports of such a prominent diamond field which this survey had not noted. King sent geologist Samuel Franklin Emmons and cartographer A.D. Wilson ahead to investigate, with King joining them soon after. Upon locating the site, they quickly concluded that it had been salted. As a geologist, King was aware that various stones formed under different conditions and would never be found together in a single deposit and thus notified investors. Further investigation showed Arnold and Slack had bought cheap cast-off diamonds, refuse of gem cutting in London and Amsterdam for $35,000 and scattered them to salt the ground. Most of the gems were originally from South Africa. Arnold returned to his hometown in Elizabethan Town, Kentucky, and became a successful businessman and banker. Diamond Company investors sued him, and he settled the cases for an undisclosed sum. Years later, he died of pneumonia after he was wounded in a shootout with a rival banker. John Slack dropped from the public view. He moved to St. Louis, where he owned a casket-making company. He later became a casket maker and undertaker in White Oaks, New Mexico, where he lived quietly and died in 1896 at the age of 76. Now, this is where the story gets really interesting. So, Michael de Guzman took core samples from the ground, which was supposedly from the Borneo site. After the samples were crushed and collected, de Guzman made sure he had some alone time with them before they were sent to be analysed. He shaved gold flakes from his wedding ring and mixed them in with the samples at a ratio of approximately 3 ounces of gold per tonne of rock. Later, when he ran out of gold from his ring, he paid locals by buying up $61,000 worth of panned river gold over the following two and a half years. With gold that has a wide variety of characteristics that had been subjected to mineralogical examination by Briex consultants, in fact, in an old report found in Briex's files, a mineralogist had reported that some gold particles in Busang samples had the darker yellow skin compared to the interior, and some had delicate morphologies composed of electrum. The yellow rims result from selective leaching from the silver from the surface of gold particle during river transport or during supergene in situ processes. Electrum is consistent with an all origin. The mineralogy gave no indication that it was alluvial gold and was consistent with the assumed origin of the samples. None of the mineralogists who had studied the gold grains gave any indication that the gold was not consistent with a hard rock origin. The salting of crushed core samples with gold constitutes the most elaborate fraud in the history of mining. In 1997, Briex collapsed and its shares became worthless in one of the biggest stock scandals in Canadian history and the biggest mining scandal of all time. Now we're going to get into a bit of a history of Briex and its founding. So, David Welsh founded Briex Minerals Limited in 1989 as a subsidiary of Briexy Resources LTD. The company did not make a significant profit before 1993 when Walsh followed the advice of geologist John Felderhoff and bought a property in the middle of a jungle near the Busang River in Kalimantan, Indonesia. The first estimate of the site by its project manager, Filipino geologist Michael de Guzman, was approximately 2 million troy ounces. Felderhoff Hoff, who was previously responsible for finding the largest gold mine on Papua New Guinea, hired the Philippines-born de Guzman as a project manager for the Borneo operation. While the two men had worked together before, it's not certain if Felderhoff was aware of de Guzman's bizarre private life. Apparently, he had four wives and families, none of whom were aware of each other, and at the time of his death, he reportedly attempted to secure the fifth marriage, but was turned down by his would-be bride. Four years earlier, de Guzman was fired from a mining company company job when it was discovered he was using the company's funds to keep one of his paramours entertained. Despite living a life that seemed more suited for sitcoms, de Guzman was a respected professional in his field, but once he arrived in Borneo, he realised he was on an impossible mission and feared losing his Briex job after his first two attempts to locate gold came up empty. De Guzman later acknowledged that Walsh considered selling the property in order to stem his losses from the unproductive gold searches. De Guzman then managed to fool his employer by salting his core samples with gold dust that he created with shavings from his wedding ring. Encouraged by this deception, Walsh directed De Guzman to continue his work. For the next two and a half years, De Guzman produced thousands of core samples salted from locally panned gold that he acquired for $61,000 that I mentioned earlier. Interviews with on-site workers revealed suspect operational procedures. For example, the testing labs were very downstream from the mining facility, giving de Guzman privacy to prepare the samples. Workers reported de Guzman leaving open bags of rock samples in his office and often blending pulverized rock samples with reddish, white, and gold-colored powders into the samples. Some journalists speculate that the initial salting was simply to extend the project, but the salting continued after the enormous estimates returned from the lab. 
The estimate of the site's worth increased over time. For example, in 1995, it was 30 million ounces, or 850 metric tons. In 1996, that became 60 million, which was 1,700 metric tons. Finally, in 1997, it was 70 million ounces. The stock was originally listed on the Alberta Stock Exchange in 1989, and subsequently in 1996 on the Toronto Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. The stock price of Briex rose to Canadian $280 per share by 1997, and at its peak, it had a market capitalization equal to US $4.4 billion, equivalent to US $7.4 billion in 2021. Those are all in dollar amounts, by the way. As word of the discovery spread, investors flocked to Briex. JP Morgan made public statements endorsing the Busang site, and the Lehman Brothers labeled it, quote, the gold discovery of the century. In 1996, Walsh began trading the once penny stock on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The stock price soared from $0.30 to $170 in just two years. Local investors saw immediate gains with one Canadian woman claiming to know, and I quote, about five new millionaires, end quote. Independent auditors that were sent in by large and institutional investors found that the pan gold had rounded edges, but de Guzman, again, had an ace up his sleeve to explain this away, and explained it was because of what he called the volcanic pool theory. So what exactly is the volcanic pool theory? Well, prior to joining the Briex operation, de Guzman had developed what he liked to call the volcanic pool theory. So de Guzman believed that when a volcano collapses back onto itself, gold is created from the massive buildup of heat and pressure. Pressure. The volcanic pool theory motivated Briex's selection of Busang and justified their unorthodox mining practices. Busang's proximity to the volcanoes made it the ideal location to test de Guzman's life work and potentially prove his theory. Under typical mining conditions, after extracting a core sample from the ground, half is sent to the lab for testing and the other half is stored for future audits. De Guzman argued that volcanic pressure causes a non-uniform distribution of gold across the core sample. For this reason, the entire sample must be tested to accurately measure the gold content. This procedure resulted in minimal core sample storage and preventing future auditors from accurately assessing the valuations. Now, de Guzman surrounded himself with young geologists that recently graduated from college. Their inexperience resulted in minimal questioning of management, despite de Guzman's unorthodox practices, and an observer likened the Briex team to, and I quote, the geological equivalent of the Bath Boys for the world champion Yankees, end quote. While they were excited to partake in the gold rush, their inexperience limited their role in the operation. This limited role allowed de Guzman's tactics to go unchecked. During the due diligence process, several investors questioned Briex's testing of the entire core sample. Felderhoff responded by asserting de Guzman's expertise, arguing he does, and I quote, not have time to educate them on the various grade determination methods for gold commonly used on a global basis in the mining industry, end quote. Because most investors lacked experience in the mining industry, many blindly trusted the volcanic pool theory justification, leading to high valuations and minimal further questioning. Normalization deviance has also plagued investors in the mining industry. Investors have fallen for similar scandals in the past, including a uranium scandal in Utah in 1954, a nickel scandal in Australia in 1969, and most recently, a gold mining scandal in China in 2007. Overconfident market expectations caused the stock prices of these companies to soar, although skepticism of reported findings increase after a scandal like Briex is uncovered, decision fatigue eventually settles in, and investors fall for similar traps over time. Some of the mining companies, including Placer Dome, organized failed takeovers, but the Indonesian government of President Suharto also got involved, stating that a small company like Briex could not exploit the site by itself. The Indonesians initially suggested that Briex share the site with the large Canadian mining firm Barrett Gold in association with Suharo's daughter, Siti Hardianti Rukmana, I am so sorry if I mispronounced that. I'm not very good at pronouncing some names, so I do apologize for that, listeners. Briex hired Suhato's son, Sijit Hajo Judanto, again, I apologize if I get that wrong and mispronounced that, I do apologize, to handle their side of the affair. Bob Hansen, another Suhato acquaintance, negotiated a deal whereby Briex would have a 45% share, Freeport McMoran Copper and Gold would run the mine, and Hansen would get a cut as well. Briex would have the land rights for 30 years. The deal was announced on February 17th of 1997, and Freeport McMoran began their initial due diligence evaluation of the site. 
Now, interestingly enough, around about this time, a fire in Briex's Borneo field office occurred in January of 1997, shortly before the new company began its work. This fire, interestingly enough, destroyed many of de Guzman's sampling records, while the cause of the fire was not determined and de Guzman was never accused of arson. The timing of the blaze and the items that were destroyed seemed more than a bit suspicious, although nothing was ever proven. Now we come to when the fraud was actually exposed and shit really hit the fan. So, the fraud began to unravel on March 26th of 1997. The American firm Freeport McMoran, a prospective partner in developing Busan, announced that its own due diligence core samples led by Australian geologist Colin Jones showed insignificant amounts of gold. A frenzied sell-off of shares ensued and Suhato postponed signing the mining deal. Briex demanded more reviews and commissioned a review of the test drilling. Results were not favourable to them and on April 1st of 1997, Briex refused to comment. On Friday, 11th of April, Northern Miner magazine put a news flash on its site, laying out three lines of evidence that Briex had been duped. First, contrary to company statements, the Busan core samples had been prepared for assay in the jungle, not in the testing lab. A videotape made by a visitor to the field site showed the humble machines common in assay labs, hammer mills, crushers and sample splitters, well-labeled sample bags clearly had finely crushed ore in them, security was lax enough that samples could easily have been spiked with gold. Second, the local inhabitants had begun panning for gold in the Busang River, but in two years they never found any. Yet, Briex claimed that gold was visible, a sign of unusually rich ore, and de Guzman's technical report confusingly called the gold submicroscopic, which is typical of hard rock gold ore. And third and finally, the assayer that tested the sample said the gold was predominantly in visible sized grains. Also, the grains showed signs consistent with being typical river pan gold dust, such as rounded outlines and rims depleted in silver. The assayer dodged the $64 billion question, saying that they were indeed ways for hard rock gold grains to acquire rounded edges. Canadian gold analyst and I'm going to butcher this name too, Egizo Biancini of BMO Nesbitt Burns considered the rumours preposterous. A third-party independent company, Strathcona Minerals, was brought in to make its own analysts. They published their results on May 4th of 1997, which was as follows. The Busang ore samples had been salted with gold dust. The lab's tests showed that gold in one hole had been shaved off gold jewellery, though it has never been proved at what stage this gold had been added to those samples. This gold also occurred in quantities that did not support the actual original assays. Trading in Briex was soon suspended on the TSC and NASDAQ and the company filed for bankruptcy protection. Now we get into the mysterious death of Michael de Guzman, so this case gets even more wild here. So on March 19th of 1997, Filipino Briex geologist Michael de Guzman was summoned back to Busan to explain his findings. However, en route to the drill site, he reportedly committed suicide by jumping from a helicopter in Indonesia. After he plummeted from the helicopter to the jungle floor below, his body was found four days later in the jungle, missing the hands and feet surgically removed, with his innards hollowed out and his genitalia gone gone. Reports state that the body was also handless, footless and faceless. Journalist Jennifer Wells, who had been sent to Borneo and was shown pictures of de Guzman's dead body, believes that his neatly suited corpse seemed inconsistent with one that had been ravaged by a wild animal. Could de Guzman have been tortured and murdered before plummeting from the helicopter? Was it even his body? We'll likely never know the answers to those questions. Another interesting point to note is that although it has been widely speculated that the body found was Michael de Guzman, the body that was found was never actually positively identified. So we can't matter of fact say with 100% certainty that the body they recovered in the jungle was actually de Guzman's. It gets even weirder when you dig into the facts surrounding the body, however, because in addition, the body was reportedly mostly eaten by animals, and according to journalist John Macbeth, a body had, interestingly enough, gone missing from the morgue of the town from which the helicopter flew. The remains of de Guzman were found only 400 metres from a logging road. No one saw the body except another Filipino geologist who claimed it was de Guzman, and one of the five women who considered themselves his wife was receiving monetary payments from somebody long after the supposed death of de Guzman. The story as I understand it was that she got $25,000 from South America, the origin of which, as I understand it, was never ascertained. 
Another interesting point was that the workers on the site the day de Guzman disappeared claimed he was carrying large duffel bags of cash. Some say he ran to South America with a few hundred thousand dollars, while others say it was upwards of hundreds of millions. With this amount of money, he could have bribed his way to freedom. There was also another rumour that Michael de Guzman had been seen in Canada years after the scandal. The explanation would be that, as was rumoured at the time, an anonymous corpse was thrown from the helicopter and de Guzman faked his own death. Now we get into the aftermath of the scandal. So by May, Briex faced a number of lawsuits and angry investors who'd lost billions. Among the major losers were three Canadian public sector organisations, the Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement Board, a loss of $45 million, the, and this is, I, I have no idea how to pronounce this, but I'll give it a go. The Sias de Depot e Placement du Quebec, the Quebec Public Sector Pension Fund, $70 million lost. And the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, they lost $100 million. There was fallout in the Canadian financial sector as well. The fraud proved a major embarrassment for Peter Monk, the head of Barrick Gold, as well as for the then head of the Toronto Stock Exchange, resulting in his ousting by 1999, and began a tumultuous realignment of the Canadian stock exchanges. Briex went bankrupt on November 5th of 1997, although some of its subsidiaries continued until 2003. Walsh moved back to the Bahamas in 1998, still professing his innocence. Two masked gunmen broke into his home in Nassau, tying him up and threatened to shoot him unless he turned over all his money. The incident ended peacefully, but three weeks later, on June 4th of 1998, Walsh died of a brain aneurysm. In 1999, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, announced it was ending its investigation with outlaying criminal charges against anyone. Critics charged that the RCMP was underfunded and understaffed to handle complex criminal fraud cases and also charged the Canadian laws in this area were inadequate. However, despite the dropping of criminal charges, civil class action suits against Briex directors, advising financial firms and Kilbourne continued. In May of 1999, the Ontario Security Commission charged Felderhoff with insider trading. No other member of Briex's board of directors or others associated with the Busang project were charged by the OSC. The OSC admitted that there was no evidence that Felderhoff was either involved in the fraud or was aware of the fraud. The trial was suspended in April of 2001 when the OSC tried to have presiding judge Justice Peter Hyam removed for alleged bias against the prosecution. This was denied by an independent judge and on December 10th of 2003, the appeal was also denied by a panel of judges. The trial resumed in 2005 and Felderhoff attended without testifying in a number of court hearings as the six-year case made its way through the system. The basis of the OSC action as well as the civil class action suits in the alleged existence of numerous and obvious red flags as detailed by Strathcona Minerals which should have been recognised. The trial of John Felderhoth was concluded on Tuesday, July 31st of 2007 with a not guilty verdict of illegal insider trading. Days after the verdict, the OSC also decided not to appeal the decision. A landmark victory for Felderhoff and his lawyer, Toronto-based Joseph Groyer, a class action lawsuit was discontinued by court order in early 2014. 3.5 million Canadian dollars worth of damages were donated to charity and the University of Ottawa since funds were deemed to be too low to be meaningfully distributed amongst the large number of plaintiffs. Felderhoff passed away on October 28th of 2019 in Manila, Philippines at the age of 79. One effect of the Briex scandal was to strengthen securities regulation in Canada. National Instrument 43101 implemented standards for disclosure for mineral projects after Briex imploded in order to improve the transparency of mining projects. Since many companies in Canada are engaged in mining operations, it was considered imperative to establish a regulatory authority over the industry's geological practices. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remains unanswered. Please rate the show and let me know what you guys think about this and the many other cases I have covered. You can follow me on all major social media platforms, YouTube, BitChute, Dailymotion. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Links are all down below in the description. If you have a case you'd like me to look at or cover, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Until next time. Next on Unanswered Questions. Two of its most illustrious citizens were 52-year-old Clarence Roberts and his wife Geneva, but in fall of 1970, the couple became embroiled in a firestorm of controversy, betrayal, and murder.